We've been in the book of Genesis for a little bit now. We started with Cain, then we went to Seth and Abel. Last week we talked about Noah. This week, this week we're going to talk about Noah's three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's a hard word, that name is. It's spelled J-A-P-H-E-T-H. I keep wanting to add the P into it, but that's silent. So I phonically spelled it for myself, but it sounds J Futh. They were the three sons of Noah, and they were all on the ark when God destroyed the world. We're talking about God getting angry at times with people, and he got pretty angry that time because he just destroyed everybody but these. That's a good amount of anger. What's notable about it is these descendants, or their descendants, these people, are the ancestors of everybody that's alive today. There's no one alive that did not come through this bloodline of Noah. Noah was the tenth generation from Adam. And then Shem is the bloodline that comes down that Christ came through. Noah was 500 years old when he first began to have children. I tried to find out how old his wife was, and there's no mention of that. Now, if she was two or three years younger, like most marriages, and she was 498, I don't know. I would have thought that would have been mentioned. And I don't know if he's 500 years old with a 20-year-old bride. I don't know that either. None of that's told to us. But we were told that he was 500 years old when he had his first child. The older I get, the more the kids get on my nerves. Can you imagine how bad it would be at 500 years? Your turn to change them. No, you change them. I did it last. If Noah had any other children, they're not mentioned in the biblical account. Only the three sons are mentioned. Here's something else that's a little bit strange. Noah had three sons. Shem is always mentioned first. You find that in Genesis 9, 18, 10, 2, 21. Even though Shem was the second born. The Bible, off, the Bible often lists people according to their prominence rather than age. And in a little bit, we're going to see why. Japheth was the oldest, Genesis 10, 21. And Ham was the youngest. Genesis 9:24. Now Japheth was born when Noah was the 500 years old, and the flood came 100 years later. So he was 100 years old when the flood came. Genesis 7, 6 and 7. Since Shem was 102 after the flood, Genesis 11:10, he must have been born when Noah was 502. Simple math, easy to figure out. There's no record of when Ham was born. But it's somewhere after Shem, Genesis 9.24. In Genesis, we're told that Shem had five sons. But in Genesis 11.11, we're told that Shem lived another 500 years and had other sons and daughters. There's no way to know the number of people that were born to any of these folks if the Bible doesn't tell us. When it says a number of sons and daughters, we have no idea what that means. When you live another 500 years and you know you can be productive at 500 years of age, you can produce a lot of children. These were some fertile people. But when you think about it, they had to replenish the earth. They had to be fertile. Here's a likely reason that Shem is always listed first. The Israelites come from the line of Shem. In fact, Semite comes from the name of Shem. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber, Genesis 10:21. This is important because the word Eber is the original of Hebrew of the Hebrew word for Hebrew. So Shem was the ancestor of all the Hebrews. Other descendants of Shem include, and I'll probably mess some of these up, the Assyrians, Chaldeans, Elamites, Amians, Moabites, Amianites, and Edomites. 
had a lot of bites and mites back then, you know. Japheth. He produced his line, Persians, Romans, Scythians, Macedonians. Ham's line produced the Canaanites, Babylonians, Phoenicians, the Cushites, and the Egyptians. Each of all these races and all the people are responsible for all the people and nations that exist today. Shem lived to be 600 years of age, Genesis 11, 10, 19. He became the ancestor of the Semitic people, Genesis 10, 1. Abraham, a seventh generation, a descendant of Shem, is the first person in the Bible to be referred to as a Hebrew. As a Hebrew. Noah blessed Shem and is above his brothers, Genesis 9, 26. And it's through Shem that the promised seed destined to crush Satan came from, Genesis 3.15. Noah's firstborn, Japheth, is listed as the father of seven sons. Their descendants become the people, now listen to this, their descendants become the people to the north and west of Israel, and after Babel spoke today the language that is classified as Indo-European languages. I know I'm giving you a lot of all the history stuff right now, Many of you may not know that. The Indo-European Indo, uh, languages are a language family to Western and Southern Eurasia. It comprises most of the language of Europe today and of Northern India and the subcontinent of the Iranian Plateau. Some of the languages of this are English. We're speaking English. We came down through Japheth, French. Portuguese, Russian, Dutch, Spanish. Colonialism has spread this all over the world. It's spoken on many continents now. Chances are really good, if you're hearing this message, you're a descendant of Noah's son, Japheth. That's your ancestor. Unless you're Jewish, or unless you're African, or unless you're Someone that come from one of the other two, if you're of European descent, chances are this was your ancestor. There's only one biblical account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it's kind of a weird story. It says in Genesis 9.20, After the floodwaters receded, Noah was a man of the soil and grew a vineyard. Well, what do we know about vineyards? You grow what? Grapes. Grapes are good to eat, right? Is there any other use for grapes? Ah, wine. Evidently, evidently, Noah went from shipbuilder, animal keeper, to farmer. And it seems that at least on one occasion, he liked the fruit of his labor just a little too much. He liked it. It only mentions once. He may not have been chronic, but once is enough. One day, after drinking too much wine, Noah passed out in his tent, lay there naked and exposed. Oh, come on, some of you who have drank in the past don't think that's weird at all. I'm getting blank stares. You guys got good poker faces. What's interesting is, we're told that Ham saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Genesis 9.22. That don't seem too bad to me. Saw his father naked and told his brothers about it. Pops in there, passed out naked. I can hear the conversation. That's all we're told in the Bible. That is what we're told. Ham saw his father naked and told his, brothers out, his two brothers outside. There are some theologians, biblical scholars. Some are pretty wise people. They have made some suggestions that Ham or Canaan, his son, did something inappropriate. But I've looked through the scriptures. It's not in the scriptures. That's nothing more than speculation. It's nothing more than taking and expounding upon something because of the consequences of what was written, but there's no mention of any act in our Bible. 
I don't believe we should speculate about God's word. God has told us what he wants us to know, how he wants us to know it. I don't think when we take and add inferences and other thoughts to what God says, it's a good thing. But we do know the extent, extent of Ham's sin on seeing his naked father was great. We know it was a great sin. I just made light of it, but it was a great sin. It was very, we're going to find out that Noah was very offended by it. Shem and Japheth refused to join in dishonoring their father. Instead, they walked into the tent backwards without looking at Noah and lay a blanket over him to cover him up. Genesis 9.23. Now we're going to jump to the heart of the matter. Heart of the sermon today. We're going to jump to the message. You needed the historical stuff. You needed the incident. But now we're going to go to when Noah wake up, woke up. I'm reading from the Bible. Genesis 9, 24 and 25. When Noah wake up, woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. Then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. He just cursed his youngest son. And he cursed the son of his youngest son. A big part of this curse was fulfilled several centuries later when the Israelites entered the land of Canaan and subdued the inhabitants. Because the Canaanites came from Ham, came from his son Canaan. Noah then blessed his other two sons and reiterated Canaan's servitude to both Shem and Japheth. Noah's curse was not an empty threat. Looking back through history, we know it was a real curse. The descendants of Ham have indeed experienced a long history of enslavement. The entire world's population come from three. The ones that came from Ham have seemed to suffer the enslavement the most. But it's not ex exclusive to Ham. Slavery has plagued the descendants of all three of the sons. Nor does this curse extend to every one that is in Ham's line. But the occurrence of slavery within the race, races descended from Ham is marked and noticeable. It's measurable. It's, you can account for it. In ancient times, the Babylonians, physician, uh, Phoenicians, um, Carthaginians, Ethiopians, and the Egyptians, which are Hamites, were enslaved by the Assyrians, Persians, Macedonians, Romans, all from the line of Shem and Japheth. We have well-documented history of that enslavement. In more modern times, now we're up to our age. Western Europeans, which are likely from the line of Japheth, and Arabs from the line of Shem, are well known to have get engaged in the slave traffic of Africans from the line of Ham. Now there's been others. There's been Irish. There's been many, many other races enslaved. But this is more in our time. This curse is still active. But this curse on Canaan does not excuse the wickedness of slavery. And more importantly, it does not mean that Ham's descendants are any less worthy in the eyes of God. They're as worthy and loved as every other person in this world. We find in Galatians 3.28, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter who your ancestor was. It matters who you trust in your heart. It doesn't matter what your background is. It matters who you trust in your heart. Nothing that has happened before, slave, free, male, female, whichever line you come through matters. It's who you love in your heart. And that has to be Jesus Christ. 
If that's the case, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. But the historical record does support the fact that Noah's curse is a powerful evidence of the accuracy of Scripture for those of you that seek such evidence. I have many people that tell me, I believe every word that God says. Then they spend a great amount of time trying to prove that word to be true. I don't seek evidence. I seek wisdom, and I seek God's grace to help me understand and receive his word. I don't need evidence. This curse is still being played out in our times today. This curse, this curse of Noah, will continue to play out for as long as mankind is on this earth. For as long as we walk, there will be slaves, there will be people trading in human trafficking. We see it running crazy today. We see people sold into bondage. And it's not just Africans. It's just not over in the east. It's just not South America. It's right here in the United States. We are one of the biggest offenders in the slave traffic in the world today. Politicians don't want to look at it. Most of us don't want to look at it. I'm reminded of Germany in World War II when the Jews were being taken on cattle cars, taken to extermination. They would pass by churches that would be in there singing praises to God. When the train would start coming, the organist would start playing louder and the people would start singing louder so they wouldn't hear the cries of the people. That's where we're at in America today. We're making noise, we're shouting, but we're denying. We need to be on our knees praying that God forgive our nation, restore our nation, forgive us, to burden our hearts for the needs of others, to burden our hearts to tell the good news. This little church needs to be filled to the rafters. We need to be so full we're bulging the walls out. Because if we're there, that means we're reaching people for Christ. Not just this little church, but every church. Big churches, little churches, medium churches. They all need to be filled. We need to have a revival in our hearts and in our nation. We need to have a revival in our life. Let's go to the Lord. Oh, dear Heavenly Father. I pray, I pray this message about Noah, about his three sons, about our history. I pray this message about our current conditions. I pray this message strike the hearts of the ones hearing it. Encourage the ones that need encouraging. Let us be bolder. As the time grows shorter, let us speak the word more forcefully, Father. Let us tell from the rooftops, shout and scream from the highest places the good news of Jesus Christ. That there are no slave or free, there are no Jew or Gentile, there are no male or female. We are all one in Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for this church. I thank you for these people. I ask a special blessing and prayer upon each one that is here today, that they will go forth energized to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for when we fail, Father. Strengthen us when we're weak, Father. Encourage us when we're down, Father. And give us happiness when we're sad, Father. We ask all of this in your most wonderful Son's name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.